Ronnie Aptika, so good to be seeing you. And uh, in in live, I suppose uh, we can call it, although we are uh, obviously in a, in a virtual world. Cheapers, I've been following your blog from Kiev, and uh, it certainly has been very enlightening about what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah, the the, the, the blog. I, I used to update that blog like once a week, normally with uh, anecdotal things or something that caught my interest. It was a great way to, you know, kind of structure your thoughts and 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 a blog. And you know better than me, Eric. I mean, you publish things. Uh, uh, it's a good way to to remember where stuff is. So I can always go and search. But since the war started, I've been writing almost every second day because it just it's like a way to try and stay saying that but the blog used to be fun and now the blog was fun and now it's like kind of my it's helping my sanity a bit because we are losing our minds uh, i mean with this this madness you know it's it's there's no other words it's just pure madness i mean i, I, I don't it's like there's no point what is the point to this war it doesn't make any sense well, uh, we'll get into that in, in obviously some detail in the next uh, few next half hour or so. But Ronnie, just going back, uh, we've known each other for a long, long time. Uh, you were one of the founders of <laughs> of internet internet solutions, and it's now the biggest ISP in South Africa. No, and and also Eric, you also you also were a fan, and and sometimes we deserved some criticism. We uh, on some of our movie projects, which you know we we are currently on. Film project number 23 in year 22. So 22 years of storytelling and independent filmmaking. And our current project, uh, um, which is complete, and we're just waiting for some news from distributors. And Alec, as you know, as a publisher, most works, most content creations don't get seen. Whether it's music, books, television, film, 95% of independent creations sit on the shelf. So the film that we've currently got complete might not be seen by anyone. And if it was 20 years ago, we would take it very much to heart and, you know, and fall apart. Now we have a thicker skin. And if, if the distributors say no, well, on to the next project. And the next project actually leads us right into the discussion. We started a project, and you, you were one of maybe I don't know, 60, 70, a few more have seen it because we kept it private. We've got this concept video of about 20 minutes that we made about tech entrepreneurs in Kiev. Uh, uh, and that was in uh, 2018, 2019. And we were meant to shoot the film in, uh, I, I remember the date, I'll never forget it because the whole world kind of went crazy with the pandemic. It was April 6, my friend Craig and a small film team were going to gather in Kiev and um, we'd booked air tickets and hotels and camera equipment. And we were going to spend the next a year uh, shooting and editing our uh, uh, documentary project around the IT entrepreneurs in Ukraine. And as you know, IT is a subject that I have a long uh, a passion and history with. And we had a lot of insight into leadership and entrepreneurship. Then the pandemic came and the project was paused. And then this January, we started booking tickets and everything for May. Uh, and the, the reason it was April and May, we wanted to film in the... Uh, uh, sunny months because the stereotypes towards Ukraine are very strong. It's always cold, it's always gray, people are very miserable, uh, uh, it's dangerous. It's not dangerous, and now it's dangerous. But up until six weeks ago, you could walk around Kiev day and night. I never heard of a bar fight there in 14 years. I never saw one in 14 years of being back and forth in Kiev in the last few years, being there full time. I never saw a, a, a a bar fight or an incident. I never heard of drunken drivers in, in Kiev. Uh, the police were quite effective. And, you you, you know, uh, um, the stereotypes are very strong. So people would, I don't know if they would even joke, but they would say to me, Ronnie, what do you eat in Ukraine? Is it bread and soup? And I said, actually, the bread and soup is pretty damn good. We have gourmet bread and great soup, you know. So we wanted to film in the summer months to show, because the summers are beautiful uh, and they're not that short. You know, the winters are longer, but there are four seasons and, and it's not that cold in the winter. If you go north, like to Norway or to northern Russia, Moscow is cold. Uh, uh, in fact, I think Moscow is cold 12 months a year. They, they, clear, they clearly are ice cold, these the Russian leaders, because they don't seem to have any warmth in their blood. I don't know, at, at the moment. Uh, you know, it's weird. I, up until eight years ago, my take on things, uh, up until the 2014 revolution, 
Russians and Ukrainians were like, not the best comparison, but I came up with it a few times, like Joburgers and Cape Tonians. There's a healthy respect for each other. But if the Joburgers took advantage of the Cape Tonians and started to rename it or something, you know, or wanted to colonize it, you know, uh, uh, I think the Cape Tonians would say, like, don't come back. And that's kind of like a simple, not the best analogy, but a good way to describe, you know, Russia and Ukraine. Up until eight, you know, in a bit years ago, Russians and Ukrainians used to holiday in each other's country. They would marry. There's, there's tons of Russians and Ukrainians with families in either country. And then, of course, the biggest was trade and industry. And after the Crimean uh, uh, takeover, which is when this war started, uh, the Ukrainians blocked everything. No TV, no internet, no travel, no flights. And there was as many flights between Cape Town and Joburg as there were between Moscow and Kiev. But all of it stopped eight years ago. And this 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 tension started then. Uh, you know, and I, I read all the commentators on Twitter, which is probably the best source. You know, why did nobody do anything eight years ago? It's a good question. You know, this thing has just been festering and, and like a fire that's, and then it's erupted. You know, and now I think the story has become way more than just Russia versus Ukraine or Ukraine versus Russia, depending where you, you know, where you're, you know, depending how you frame it. But I think this is about good and evil. If 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 evil is allowed to spread, it will spread beyond Ukraine, it's like a cancer. And uh, I think if the West helps Ukraine to stop this. It's not for Ukraine to win. What does that mean? Ukraine's not trying to beat Russia or destroy the Russian army. They just want the Russians out of Ukraine. Russia's got a different definition. They want to destroy Ukraine and take it over. But if the if the Ukrainians can keep the Russians away, I think the whole world benefits. Uh, not just economically, like with food and with everything else that Ukraine supplies that people are unaware of, but just in the sense of there's evil in the world. And, and if this evil is allowed to to grow, it's going to affect everyone, and that's my simple philosophical take. You know, I, I might be wrong, I, I, but I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't think this is about Russia and Ukraine anymore. It m- might have been in the first few days, but this Putin's not going to stop at Ukraine. Uh, uh, and if we did, if we think he is, I think that's naive. We all. I was naive. We were all naive in Kiev, thinking like this is just a bluff. And on the first day, we stuck around because it's, he's just scaring everyone. You know, it's going to be over in in a couple of days. And on the second day, we just said, we, we don't want to wait and see. It just got very scary. I mean, it was winter. I was in a T-shirt like this, and I couldn't stop sweating. Eric, I didn't see bombs. I didn't see explosions. I haven't seen death, but I felt it. I heard the building we lived in rumble quite a few times. There were bomb blasts. Uh, uh, um, there was this fear everywhere I've never experienced and we still have it. Like we, it hasn't. We don't sleep at night so well. Like, you know, it's like it hasn't left us. We have our home there. All my belongings are there. We have friends there. We love living there. And uh, the place was being discovered. I would say in the next five years, any traveler would have come through there because it was becoming like the next hotspot. And it was fun and alive and and full of creativity and 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 humor. And again, the stereotype would go, what humor? If you came there, Alec, I know you've got a good sense of humor. You would laugh a lot. And Alec, I also know a bit about your personal life, and you've also had personal trauma, and I have had my own trauma with American litigation, whatever other trauma. The difference between this trauma and, say, a car accident or, or your house burns down is this trauma isn't over. Like every day, Alec, we're checking the news to say, is Kiev still there? Yeah, are our friends alive? Is the apartment still there? We don't know. And then we check and... It is there, but it's not like the trauma isn't over. You know, and I don't know, Alec, like I haven't bought anything in a, in a four weeks now. I haven't, I, other than like food, I don't know if I buy a t-shirt, where is my stuff, Alec? Where do I put the t-shirt? I don't know where we're living out of a bag. And yes, we're in family. And as my, my uh, wife reminds me, we are the lucky ones. 99% of Ukraine doesn't have anywhere to go. Half the elderly population doesn't speak English. The country is not wealthy like South Africa. It could be. It's been mismanaged. And this is part of Ukraine's struggle with corruption and oligarch. And it was getting better and better and better. Uh, uh, and, you know, it had a chance of becoming a prosperous nation where wealth would be more distributed because the country is very wealthy resource-wise. It's just been mismanaged and it's only been independent for three decades. And it was only starting to find its feet now in recent years. 
and then this war started. So we are very, very uh, uh, lucky, Alec, in the sense that we had somewhere to go, family to care for us. You know, I've got a credit card in my pocket. Most Ukrainians don't have that. And if Ukraine is destroyed, Alec, let's say, and it can happen. I think if it's up to Putin, it would happen. You know, uh, you know, uh, if it was flattened, where do you displace 45 million people? I, I don't understand. I, doesn't, I can't comprehend that. If everyone's homes are destroyed, they can't just live in a, in a, in a smoldering uh, like landmass. Where, where do they go? You know, I know there's three and a half million plus minus refugees in, in Poland, but after their simple, uh, I don't know, a, a small aid wears off, I'm sure they're getting some aid. Like nobody can fund that. So where do these millions, and there's going to be millions more, where, where does everybody go? This is a, Money. yeah. It's heartbreaking, oh. Alec, and I, sorry, I get, I get really emotional, yeah. Alec, over this thing because it just doesn't make any sense. Like it just, it's just cruel. It's cruel. And I, as you know me, Alec, I'm a very gentle guy. Like I can't compute this kind of evil. So I get very worked up on this. Like it just doesn't sound normal. It's not normal. It's just mad. It's very crazy, Alec. How did you get out of Kiev? Where, where, just tell us that story. It could be a bit cathartic as well. That was like, I'll never forget the details. It was like four days literally of not sleeping in a car. You know, we even had strangers look after us one night in the middle of nowhere that we kind of slept like on their couches because the journey out of Kiev was like just, it, it was scary. Like we were on this highway. It was a seven, eight, four lanes in each direction. But on the outgoing, the incoming lane, they used the cars. Just There was no rules. Everyone just drove very orderly. Lots of accidents. Petrol stations with queues around the block. Uh, and on the one or two lanes that were incoming, there were tanks and military vehicles. And everyone was like hooting in, in support of Ukrainians. But it hadn't hit yet. It hadn't hit yet the extent. We hadn't seen Mariupol flattened and Kharkiv destroyed. Kharkiv was one of the pride and joys of Ukraine, the old capital from the Soviet days. Very beautiful city, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately close to the Russian border, you know. Uh, um, Kiev is a good six, seven hundred kilometers away from the Russian border. But I was reading some, I think it was on the BBC earlier this morning, that like it's easier for the Russians to refuel when they attack Kharkiv than Kiev because it's close to them. You know, the border is close. So we, we, we got on the road at 10 o'clock uh, that that. Friday, I'll never forget this, Alec, at nine o'clock, we were ready to go and we actually cleaned the apartment for one hour. It was just madness. We put all the laundry away, you know, put the, threw the rubbish out. I don't know what we were doing. It was just this shock. We were, Alec, and I took nothing. I took nothing because I, I, I couldn't understand what was going on. I got my laptop and phone and credit card. Like we only took food. We packed, so we left half the food in Poland. Like, you know, we took so much food. Like I didn't take any clothes. I didn't take a watch. I didn't take anything. It was just, just crazy. And if I, if I, if you'd give me one hour and just a backpack and said, pack up some of your personal effects. Some of them might be valuable. Some might be just. Uh, you also know me enough. I'm quite sentimental. I, I would have grabbed some IS paraphernalia, a crazy monkey T-shirt, something. You know, a material sticker from the material Riyad Musa film. You know. I, I, I would have taken just, I had like, some things were totally irreplaceable, you know, like a um, driver's license, <laughs> like whatever I left behind there, you know. And I think I've got my driver's license. I left some other personal, like uh, like, author uh, like government things, like, you know, an American immigration card that I had for, uh, I don't even know what else I've got there. Ah, so it's, the more I think about it, I keep going, wow, my house keys. <laughs> for Janet, <laughs> left us. It was just we didn't think, so we packed like food uh, and nappies, and we got in the car at ten o'clock. We we were ready at nine, but we spent an hour cleaning the flat. Nobody spoke. It was just a shock factor. Ten o'clock, we we got and we thought, okay, the roads are okay. It all seemed calm, and then fifteen minutes later, we were on the highway, and then it was just cars. I've never seen so many cars ever, and it took us about maybe three hours to drive the first 50 kilometers. Like we weren't moving and there was no music. Eric. There was no, normally when cars, you hear radios, nothing. And you couldn't see into the cars because every car was packed with luggage. It was just, this, you knew something was bad because there was no sound. 
there were jets and helicopters, not often, and there were bomb blasts, and the cars would shake. And you go, it's just very freaky. And I was sweating, like, you know, in winter, in a T-shirt. Like, I didn't understand. I was, couldn't stop perspiring, you know, and it was just fear. It was just pure fear. And you knew life had changed. Life had just changed. Like, we didn't understand, like... I could, and I, I didn't eat for about three, four days. I just, we had a lot of water, a lot of the food, and I kept sipping it because my tongue was stuck to my lip. I mean, you get dry mouth, and I was just like in, in, in the state of shock, you know? And uh, yeah, and, and then we, we, we eventually got out of the city limits. I don't know, by the time it was dark, literally it took us to get like to say, out of Burstport, if you're talking right from Joburg, like 10 hours. You know, and we didn't, not like a drive to Cape where you stop and you have a, a sandwich on the side of the road. We didn't stop. And I think we stopped twice because the cars weren't moving and peed on the highway like everyone else because there was lots of time to get out of the car. They didn't move, you know, uh, and everybody was quite understanding. There were lots of people running into the bushes. Ukraine is a huge forest and it's a big timber, source of timber. So there's lots of trees everywhere so you can run and pee and come back. But, um, you know, we kind of got out of the city limits by the time it was dark. And, and then we were going to my wife's grandfather's farm just outside of Lviv. The thinking was, don't go to the city. If there's a war, the city might be under attack. So we didn't want to go into the city center. But Lviv as a city, which is a very beautiful city in the world, uh, uh, up there with Kiev, hasn't been attacked. It hasn't been attacked. And what's so crazy is, is Lviv is very close to the Polish border. It's like 60, 70 k's away. So, you know, my, my crazy thinking, Eric, is that Ukraine should just bomb Poland and blame it on Russia. <laughs> like a James Bond plot. Just send a bomb and say the Russians did this and pull the West into the war properly. You know, that's just a crazy thought. I'm sure they've had that thought as well. I don't think I'm the only clever one around. But, um, but Lviv hasn't been bombed. I know there was bombs 40 k's from Poland at a aircraft maintenance facility and then they blew up like a petrol refinery also again outside Lviv but my friends in Lviv said nothing has come into the city you know uh, so we stayed on this farm and it took us to get to the farm uh, once it got dark a good five six hours and we're talking like it's only a couple of hours away it should have taken us two hours it took us maybe six or seven hours because the ways took us on some back road and the potholes here, I mean, South Africans would aspire to these kind of roads. You know, the roads in, in the, in, that connect the cities of Ukraine are pretty good, the highway to Lviv, but we got off the highway. I don't even know why, the ways took us. And I couldn't stay awake anymore. And at about 12 o'clock that night, I, I said uh, uh, um, to my wife, we're gonna have an accident. Like I, I know I, 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 I was, and she said, let's just talk. And, like, and, and as soon as we stopped talking, I fell asleep and I said, I can't keep doing this. My wife only got her driver's license recently and hasn't got a lot of practical experience. But at 12.30 that night, she had a driving lesson. I said, better me sleep as a navigator than as the guy holding the wheel. And we literally slalomed these potholes. But when I say potholes, I think they're about a meter. Every meter, there's another one. No, every three meters. So you literally are slaloming on country roads. Some of them are dust roads. Uh, uh, again, this is not Ukraine. These are, this is the farm. So Ukraine is a huge farming country. And so the highways are pretty good. They're not as good as our highways, but they're pretty good. You know, they're pretty good. Uh, um, but this was like country roads. I don't know why we got off the main highway. I don't know what happened, but the ways, the ways messed us up. And it took us that last section, about three hours. It should have taken 20 minutes. And by the time we got at uh, fa the family farm, and we literally just collapsed. Literally just, I actually just fell down and stepped back on, a, on a couch. I just, I didn't, I, I'm not a great steeper. I just collapsed. And then the next day, like we were in a daze, we didn't know what was going on. It was just one day. So everyone's listening to news. There was there was a war. It did hit us. There was a war, and this wasn't a bluff. And uh, now the thinking was we stay in Western Ukraine, you know, because it seems to be like the, the online wisdom is that's where it's safer. And that was the plan for like twenty four hours, and then it just the, the tensions and anxiety rose, and we thought we we can get out of. Ukraine, we've got, um, you know, a credit card, we've got family uh, 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 in a few parts of the world. The first thinking was we were going to go to Austria uh, and that plan kind of changed. Uh, and then eventually we decided we're going to come to SA. Uh, actually, no, we only decided that in Poland when we got to Poland and could catch our breaths. Um, but it, it was it was another nightmare, just 
getting across the border. Uh, there were these reports of cars uh, uh, that were queuing up for like up to four days. We have a small baby. It's winter. It's kind of scary because also I'm from South Africa. So you, you don't want to be stuck. You, you have this African mentality. Like, I don't want to sit in a car in the middle of the night in, in the field. Like, you know, what happens if guys come and hijack us? You know, nobody hijacked anyone. I mean, I, not that we heard. But, you know, as a South African, I don't leave my phone lying around. We always lock the doors. And in Kiev, they always used to laugh at me saying, Ronnie, when you go to the tour in the restaurant, why do you take your phone with you? You know, just leave on the table. I said, oh, it's, a, it's a South African conditioning, you know. And Alec, it is quite ironical that I came to SA to be safe. Because Africa, as much as we love it, and, you know, I love SA, it does have a danger element, you know, as we all know. But we came here to be safe, which is just some humor and some irony. But... Um, but there's no war here, you know, so there's a different kind of danger here. Um, but the journey out of uh, Western Ukraine to Krakow was just, we, we had a 40-hour kind of detour into nowhere with no steeple. We couldn't cross the border because of that queue of cars, and we gave up on that plan. We were going mad. Uh, and there's lots of details in that plan, but it doesn't really matter, but it was just unpleasant. <laughs> the whole thing was unpleasant, and it was, it was just downright traumatic and uh, um uh, and then are there people at the border ronnie are there are there people at the border watching passports and things uh, absolutely I, I, oh that's just border patrol uh, and obviously things like corona uh, had all been relaxed so you didn't have to show pcr tests and stuff like that but when we so we we landed up getting on like like a refugee bus which was only through just a we had a bit of luck we had a bit of luck and the bus from lviv to Krakow, I think we were maybe 17 or 18 hours. When we got to the border, there was a queue for buses, there was a pedestrian queue, and there was the queue of cars, of private cars. Uh, uh, and when the bus got there, they took everyone's passports, and we had a, a chance to make a pee and stuff. And I walked around the border and knocked on a few of the windows of the cars that it was their turn to cross. And I remember there was a lady with her dog and, and it's, it's, I think it's important just to explain the car. It was like one of those mini, uh, not Cooper, the mini uh, uh, cub man or countryman. It's like slightly bigger than uh, the Cooper, not mini, the Cooper countryman. It's slightly bigger. The reason I'm demonstrating that or explaining that is it demonstrates like this was a middle class person. She spoke English. She was in her 30s and she looked dead. I said to her lady, I said to her in Russian, like, did you know, can you speak English? And she said, yes, because I speak quite a bit of Russian, and, and uh, which is not uh, very favorable at the moment. But um, my Ukrainian is, is, I can say a few words. Uh, and it is a different language. It's like, it's like Afrikaans and Dutch. There is some overlap, but when Afrikaans-speaking people go to Holland, they don't really understand the Dutch so well and vice versa. So there is some overlap, but you know uh, uh, the Russians don't really understand the Ukrainians. So, and in, in Kiev, everybody spoke Russian. And English, you know, but um, so I, I've learned Russian over a long time, and my Russian not great, but I could get by. Um, and I asked, she's now I can speak English, and I said to her, "How long have you been in your car?" She says, "I'm on day four. And then I asked the next car, and they tell me the same thing. And I thought, like we've got a baby, it's snowing, like you can't live in a car for four days. We were we were, we tried it for forty hours, and we still had a pit stop at a hostel, and it's some strangers who took us in for the night, and. We just abandoned the plan. It didn't work. We, we couldn't sit in a queue of cars. And even then, it was unknown. Like inching forward every hour. Like inch. Doesn't your car run out of battery power? I mean, I don't understand it. And this lady said she still had another 20 hours to drive to where she was going in Poland. And I said, but how is that possible? She said, she, 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 she know my name. She said, she said she feels like she's about to collapse. She looked like death. I mean, like, and this was the whole queue of cars. So... I believe now the border is quite quiet because that wave is over. Because uh, I speak to my friends there daily and there's all kinds of reports. And then, Alec, there, there is some humor. It's a bit of a uh, mixed bag of humor. But I was getting quite a few people contacting me from South Africa telling me what to do, which I found quite humorous <laughs> and annoying because my phone was dying. I had no way to charge it. Mm. And someone would say to me, a person you know, like a bright person, you know, would say, all you have to do is drive to the Slovakian border. I said, but you're not here. They said, but Google says it's four hours. I said, I don't know what Google says. I can tell you the roadblocks 
or every four minutes. I don't know about this four hours. It's going to take 24 hours just to leave the city because of all the roadblocks. And they said, no, 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 the Google. I said, stop telling me what Google says. You, you're killing my battery power. And I actually had a few people like fight with me, say, Ronnie, you've got a bad attitude. I said, please don't contact me again. If you never speak to me again, I don't care if we've been friends 50 years, don't contact me again because you're not helping me right now. And I said, I'm trying to help you. I said, but you're not. Stop. I even had strangers calling me saying, I need a lift from like, like Bloemfontein to Durban. Can you pick me up? And I said, where did you get my number? No, so-and-so gave it. I said, please don't contact me again. They said, but can't you help me? I said, I actually can't. We got a full car. There's not even space to like for like for luggage. You know, we had baby food, and we, uh, my mother-in-law, who's now in Poland, you know, uh, we had no. We had a small little car. I said, "There's no space." I'm not an ugly person, you know me. We didn't have space. We had a baby and a baby seat. Where someone going to sit? It's winter on the roof, and I was getting told, "Ronnie, you've got a bad attitude." I, I, I can't be dealing with this. I can't be dealing with this right now, you know. And I, and I'm very kind, but uh, we didn't have any capacity to help anyone. You know, we weren't cruel at all, but uh, I'm not a cruel person, but like we just had no space in the car. The car was full. We had four people and food and like there was, it was a small car, but I'm saying, so there was some craziness as well, but that I just started blocking numbers. Eventually I was, I was getting some help from someone to do with some authoritative body in SA. Well, I know everybody meant well. I know everybody meant well, but the, I said to the lady, she actually called me and I said, who's this? I said, are you here? She says, no. I said, well, how do you know how I'm going to cross the border? You're not here. So I don't know what you're looking on, but you're not helping me. And she said, I understand. And I just blocked the numbers because I, I couldn't take any more the where the random calls. And the phone was going to die. And it was so Eric, there's, there's so many interesting stories here about technology. Sure. I mean, you know what is amazing is that we are trying to complete that film, that video that you saw. We are now busy with Zoom interviews. We've done already, uh, I think, 10 hours of material. We've got about another 10 hours to go and then we start editing. So we are having interviews with people in Ukraine uh, uh, when they have this heightened sense of fear and anger. And what is coming out on these Zoom sessions is just extraordinary. And it is extraordinary. And I've got to give the credit money to my film friend. You've actually met him. You don't know him well, but his name is Craig Freiman. So he's the, the storyteller here. I, you know, I'm his kind of sidekick partner. I'm the driver of the project, but he's the main artist. And between him and the editors, I mean, we're having a field day with the, 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 the footage because if we record people in six months from now, assuming the war's over, they won't have the same intense fear, anger, emotion, passion that is coming out now. And the kind of questions we are, a lot of it is just conversation, but there are questions like, will you be friends with Russians when this is over? And what people are saying is just, it's it's very uh, uh, um, powerful. It's very powerful. Um, you know, uh, all kinds of questions like, what will you do when the war is over? I mean, everyone, including Sean Penn, and every other filmmaker and his dog are going to be making a movie about this. And my view, Alec, is that most people will be talking about the evil Russians, the refugees, the destruction, the death, the pointlessness of it all, the history of where this has all come from. We don't need to do that because you can watch a news channel for that. and You can watch Sean Penn's movie and I'm sure it'll be brilliant because what he's been saying online has just been so powerful. I mean, wow, I don't know him, but what a smart man. And uh, um, he's just be, yeah, I mean, I, I, he said in the last talk, just before the Oscars, he said, if Ukraine is destroyed, the children of our world, I, I don't know his exact words, I must watch it again, I've watched it like five times, we'll stop dreaming because like, evil will triumph in the world. You know, that, that was kind of the gist of what he was saying. And I've been saying, I think many people are saying similar things, but we, we're not going to, we, 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 we had a story about entrepreneurs and we are carrying on with that story. We're asking the same people from that video who are all in Ukraine, you know, and I've got access because we are all friends. Like, what will happen when the war's over? What are we going to do? Do we carry on? And, and Eric, you know what's amazing? You, you were in this part. Like, some of them are using the infrastructure. Like, if I look at one of the, uh, um, the people in the video, one of our friends, they've got a very big database. Uh, um, and they are of... I don't know how many, maybe a hundred million email addresses, huge all over the world. And they are contacting people. They are breaking all the poppy laws. Nobody cares. And saying, help Ukraine, give money. They are trying to inform 
Russian people that are on the database of what's really good, what CNN they say. You can't be listening to all your state media. So everyone is trying to use their infrastructure, their resources, their, their, their reach to try and help and to educate, especially the Russians, you know, like uh, because they don't know Eric, what is going on. I, I was talking to a filmmaker colleague, a Russian in Moscow, who is against the war and everyone's too scared to speak out. And I said to him, his name is Michael, Mikhail. I said to him, Mikhail, is it true that most Russians support the war? And he said to me, Ronnie, you're asking me the wrong question. You know, he said, the question is, do most Russians believe what their president tells them? That's what, that's what, it says, if, they, if, if Putin tells them the sky is pink, then 80% of Russia will say the sky is pink because they live in an authoritarian society and they are afraid. So if Putin says the Ukrainians are a threat to us, we're getting rid of Nazis. I mean, what does that mean? Nazis? I, I, I've been in Kiev for a long time. I never saw a Nazi. What is this nonsense? That's just some bullshit. You know, the president is Jewish. The head of the defense force is Jewish. The prime minister is Jewish. What Nazis? That's just some cockamamie story. It's like he could have, he could have said they all, uh, I don't know, eat too many burgers. We're going to invade. We vegetarians. It's offensive. I mean, he could have said anything he wants. You know, like he just made up a story. Every country's got a Nazi. I'm sure South Africa's got some neo-Nazis somewhere in the desert. But they're not a threat to South Africa. We don't go to war with some country because... We don't fight with Zimbabwe because maybe there's a few neo Nazis in Zimbabwe somewhere. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's like. It's Ronnie, given what you've gone through, and I can understand that the Russians, would, or many Russians, would, 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 would perceive everything in the way that they've, they've been told. But what about South Africans here? Uh, and I know it's, it's, it's kind of very fresh for you to have arrived, but, but what are you making of it? I haven't, you know, I've only followed what I've seen uh, on online, like on mainly on social media and the, the kind of people who are uh, crying out saying it's ridiculous that South Africa would not uh, uh, condemn the war. And then there's been, you know, some other more enlightened points that people say, you know, when South Africa was supported by Russia in the apartheid days, they seem to forget that they were supported by the Soviet Union, not by Russia. And the Soviet Union included Ukraine. So it's pretty likely Ukraine also helped South Africa, you know, because it was a collective that helped, you know, the struggle. So I think it's quite sad that uh, South Africa is one of a handful of countries that doesn't condemn the war. But I don't really have much more perspective on it. And I don't have a viewpoint other than I just find it quite sad. You know, I don't think South Africa is... Uh, um, um, ability to shape this war is significant. You know, Germany is significant. If Germany stops buying oil from and, 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 and gas from, from Russia, I think it's to the tune of, what, $700 million a day? That is significant. Like if South Africa said, we hate Russia, we don't think you, I, don't, I don't think it has much bearing. But France and Germany, for sure. America, absolutely. You know, so... Maybe, I mean, China definitely, China obviously is a whole different discussion, you know, but I, I don't think South Africa has the most bearing on the outcome, but it is kind of sad that, you know, that um, I, I know when we spoke to the Ukrainian embassy just after arriving, they said to us uh, um, uh, um, that uh, in Pretoria, they said to us they are actually potentially, well, I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what the man said uh, in Ukrainian, you know, and my wife was telling me while I was listening in. That they're saying they might close down because of South Africa's position, you know, to to you know to, on the wall, you know. So we don't know if they have closed oh. down, but that kind of tells you a lot, you know. From from your perspective, for for years you told me about Ukraine. Everybody, everyone who would ever give me five minutes, I would tell them. the most the most beautiful the most beautiful woman in the world, and you went and married one of them. I remember that very clearly. Uh, what what actually got you to move there to go and live there? You know, Eric, that wasn't so much by design. The pandemic shaped a bit of that because in the last two years, you couldn't really come back. So, and then we had a baby, you know, so, you know, so, so, uh, uh, I mean, the last two years was, I think the whole world kind of just conformed because of lockdown. And then we bought that apartment about five years ago and I was spending about half the year there and half here. And before that, up until five years ago, I was spending about 
maybe like every month out of three there. Um, and we'd done some work there and life was peaceful there. There was no crime. Uh, uh, the city of Kiev, uh, I mean, I have some knowledge of Ukraine in general. Ukraine's big, like South Africa, it's not a small country. You know, it's the biggest country in Europe if you exclude Russia. I mean, Russia to me is always more Asian. Um, but it is a naturally beautiful country. It's got, I mean, I don't think anything will ever beat the kind of magnificence of Cape Town and of the mountains, but it's got its own beaches and mountains and it's got its own Alps and its own Midlands and everything. It's so beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. I mean, South Africa is probably the most beautiful country you could ever find on the planet. And I'm quite, I'm sure like Eric, like you, we've both seen a bit of the world. I mean, uh, uh, South Africa is really, really beautiful. And Ukraine is up there. I would put it like you know, in the top, top most beautiful places. It's just got a brand problem and there's no real marketing. So tourism was low and it was starting to develop. But we, we you know, like some people, if, if you look at me, Alec, and you know me, I'm quite pale. I like winter weather. So I'm not a sun guy. I never was a Clifton or Klettenberg Bay person. I can't handle the sun. So so I enjoyed the winters there. And it wasn't that cold. It's it's it, it's like in winter, the average temperature might be one or two degrees. If you can handle Joburg cold, you can handle a, a, a Kiev cold. You know, it, it was more cold in Lviv. It's a bit more north, but uh, um, uh, 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 it's actually northwest, but it was colder there. Uh, but Kiev wasn't, it was, you know, there were, February had one or two weeks where it got to minus 10, but it didn't last long. Everything was insulated you, you, indoors. I'd wear a t-shirt and my shorts. You know, it was very cozy. I always slept better in the cold. I could think better. You know, the nights were longer. I could, I, I work more in the evening. I could do more work, you know, more creative work. So, I, for, you know, for the artist in me, the climate really, I find it hard to create when I'm sweaty. <laughs> It's just me when I'm hot and sticky and, you know, but when it's cold and you have a cup of tea and, you know, I, I, I find it good for the creativity. So I, 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 for me, it just, I found a place that worked for me. And that was even dumb luck. I've got a friend called Jacques, who's a very successful entrepreneur, ex-African, who's been living in London for 13 years. And 14 years ago, me and him went by chance to Kiev. He, he was part of a Harvard MDP program for like people who own their own business on a management development program and he had a, a classmate that was from ukraine and we had like a connection and somebody kind of was showing us around and we just thought it's like another christmas maybe we'll take a trip and and have a look together and i met with jacques one ukrainian guy there called also called another michael lots of michaels michael misha and me and him became very close friends uh, like one of my closest friends today and uh, we've got business interests. Uh, it actually sounds fancy. I'm not really a business person, as you know, but we've got a business interest together and a lot of uh, history together and some business experiments together and a lot of just, you know, f networking and, uh, and, and, um, and, and, and kind of conspiring together around creative ideas and technical things. Most of them never got past the dinner table, but just fun things, you know. And it always is about a person, you know, one person. You can go to New York and be very lonely and hate it. Everyone's got the story about like big cities. Or you can go to New York and have one friend that takes you under their arm, under their wing and shows you around and you go, oh, I love New York. Because New York can be, or London can be very lonely if you don't know people. Nobody cares. You could drop dead in Piccadilly Circus and people will just carry on to their meetings. And it's like, it's a bustling city, you know. So if you know someone and they show you around and you don't feel overwhelmed, and I had that through Michael uh, and still today in, in Kiev, and we just fell in love with the place. It's beautiful. The eating, I mean, and people always laugh at the stereotypes. Like, is it dangerous? Do you see mafia? I said, I've never seen mafia. You know, I'm an IT nerd. I don't know. There's no mafia in IT. I don't know. Maybe there's mafia in coal mines, but I don't know anything about coal mines. You know, I, I, I don't know. I have never met mafia. They've got a chain of restaurants there. Like, we've got, uh, what have we got here? Nando's. They've got mafia. It's got 24-7. It's Actually, not bad. It's kind of like a wimpy. It's like Ukrainian wimpy. It's got, it's got, it's a 24-7. There's lots of them, and it's called mafia. And often, it is mafia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I often would take a photo under the sign, this big neon sign. I said, hey, see, I found mafia. <laughs> but I don't know any mafia. I don't know. I never I never saw, I, I mentioned a bar fight. I never saw a two-drink minimum scam like you have in London or Budapest or Prague where you go into a bar and you don't read the fight for $100 a drink. I never had a taxi like in Turkey drive me around once for 10 hours when I was just trying to cross the street. You know, I, I never had a scam there. You know, I never saw aggression. This was a peaceful place, and um, and um, 
it was fun. It was like a combination of New York. I mean, so I want to say it was. It is fun. It's a combination of New York and Berlin and Tel Aviv all together. Highly creative, highly entrepreneurial, never stops buzzing. It's a big city. So like you go to Warsaw and you walk around, it takes you a day. You go to Berlin two days. You go to Kiev, it takes you two weeks to see the old city. There's a lot of stuff there. And it's like a photographer's dream. I mean, wow. And also in the last, obviously the pandemic, you know, did turn, uh, 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 you know, there was a downturn in travel, but even in the pandemic, I saw a bit of it, but before Hollywood movie shoots were becoming very common in the last five years in Kiev, just like Prague, they were overtaking, they were, they were uh, challenging Prague to their dominance. And it was very common to read in the press every other month. Tom Cruise was seen, you know, in this restaurant, Brad Pitt was seen there, Jared Leto was seen here. Uh, we once had lunch uh, in a restaurant and there was the, the they just uh, were leaving the red hot chili peppers you know, uh, uh, I mean, like, you know, Madonna, uh, 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 even Michael Jackson, I know he's passed away, but apparently he played there a few times. I mean, crazy things happened there. So that was a joke that went nowhere. But I mean, people saw what's, things. What's happened in, to Michael, your friend Michael? My friend Michael in Kiev, uh, uh, um, he actually, so a couple of my friends and colleagues there had the most unusual story. Uh, my friend Roman, who's our neighbor, I'm pointing as if I'm in Kiev, I always used to point, he lived above us, he lives above us. He was on a train on the Wednesday to the Carpathians for a five-day ski holiday with his wife and daughter. And the internet isn't so good on those trains. I've, I've caught them. And they literally fell asleep on the train after midnight. The train left at midnight, and it's a 10-hour train to the Carpathians. And I think when they got online at sunrise, they discovered they couldn't come back. So he's still in the Carpathians. He's not in a ski resort. Uh, he they they found someone to rent them a house and I think there's like ten families sharing like sleeping on the floor. In he says it's, it's not it's not dirty. They've got food, but he says Ronnie like we're all sleeping on a floor, sharing a toilet. It's not great, but most Ukrainians are rugged and don't, mo every Ukraine every Ukrainian attic was poor. There was no money. It wasn't like South Africa where you had when apartheid ended and the government changed. You did have wealthy people in all colors and cultures, not just whites. You know, there were wealthy Indians, wealthy blacks, uh, wealthy Chinese. There were wealth. There was no wealthy Ukrainians. You know, everyone was poor 30 years ago. So everybody can remember rugged living, you know. Uh, uh, um, and when Roman says to me, Ronnie, we're all sleeping on the floor, he says, like old days. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, know, you, know, so, you know, so they, they kind of laugh and they are very funny and quite resilient. But he's stuck in the mountains and his wife uh, is now due. Uh, she, she told me last week, four months pregnant, and they don't have access to doctors. And so there's some stresses. So he's in Ukraine. Men under 60 can't leave, you know. Uh, not all of them have to fight, but they have to do something, you know, whether they're making food for the army or whatever. So, so uh, um, uh, he donated a lot of money to the army. He's a wealthy guy. Uh, and it's in all the news because he's trying to inspire other, a very humble guy. But he, he said, I'm not trying to show off that I have some money, but I'm trying to inspire all the rest. Because I, I've, got, I, I've got a bit of a, like, a, 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 like um, I don't know if I'm right, but it's my gut feel. Like, we are the oligarchs. Like, my friends are not oligarchs, but you get these oligarchs, these guys that did nothing to society. They've added, in my opinion, zero, but they control all the resources uh, uh, and like Roman's a self-made IT guy, took a risk a couple of times. One of the one of the projects became his business of, since two thousand six. But the oligarchs are not in IT; they are in resources, mining, land rights, agriculture, you know, transport. Like I haven't seen any news about oligarchs helping Ukraine, the Ukrainian oligarchs. And I'm pretty sure, Eric, when the war is over, they'll be the first to steal all the aid money. You know, I'm just being cynical here. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. There's a good chance I'm wrong. I'm, I could be talking the biggest out of nonsense ever. But there's no news on oligarchs. Some of them are worth tens of billions of dollars. Where Where is there? I hear about their factories being blown up, you know, in Mariupol. Uh, uh, um, but where is their contribution to Ukraine? I don't see it. And they've got billions and billions and billions. And they are like parasites, in my opinion. But anyway, it's part of the problem, not just in Ukraine. In, uh, we have it here in SA. Wherever there is big wealth, you know, that came quickly, you don't see in every country, you don't see 
a, a, you know, a massive charitable kind of momentum. You know, I know it from my fundraising days when I did a lot of fundraising. Some of the stingiest people, maybe maybe not stingy, clueless people, were the new money. You know, like oligarchs in, in Ukraine, all this new money that came in. People who became billionaires like in one year, to me that's not natural. You know, or in two years, whatever, in a short period of time. But that's another whole podcast. But you know, and there's a greater picture there. But my 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 question is, where are all these Ukrainian oligarchs? And maybe I'm wrong, Alec. Maybe they give privately. But they love their names and lights, so I don't believe they're doing anything, you know. So I could be totally wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I need to apologize. What happens to the Aptika family next? Your your wife, your baby. This 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 is a painful you're question. Away from the from the heat at the moment. Yeah. But, but we want to go back there. Like we want to go back and be part of the rebuilding. We have if if our film project works, and you know a little bit about my my journey, like. If we can complete the film and if it turns out good, and if we can get it seen, there's a lot of ifs. Um, that might do something good for Ukraine because we were trying to tell a story that made fun of the stereotypes and actually poked fun at the strange perceptions in a very respectful way without insulting Ukrainians. We were very sensitive towards it. And, uh, and without insulting the world, because we don't want to call the world stupid either, you know. But I used to get a lot of stupid questions about, is it dangerous? What do you eat? Is it always cold? You know, where's the mafia? And I thought, gee, I don't know. I, I haven't seen any of these things and I, I'm here. But so we, we, we're hoping that our film uh, project can do some good to show the humor of Ukraine, to show the you know, entrepreneurial spirit of Ukraine, to show the importance and the rising food prices at the moment have a, 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 a huge uh, origin, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the Ukraine war story has a huge bearing on the food prices because Ukraine is called the bread basket of Europe and because you, Ukraine is the number one, say, sunflower oil producer in the world and the fourth biggest, I think, wheat producer. I mean, it's mad numbers. People say, where? Never heard of this place. I say, well, your cornflakes, where do you think they're coming from? Good chance they came from Ukraine. And people say, no ways. So you go, yes ways, look at the prices. And sadly, Alec, the poorest of the poor, I read like Egypt, for example, and a lot of North African countries are already struggling because the Russians aren't letting the wheat ships out of the Black Sea. You must have read some of this. They're stopping the ships and there's food on those ships. So the, 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 the implications for the world are far reaching. And uh, we, we want to go back uh, uh, as soon as possible. So Alec, so, so I, unfortunately, part of the trauma is there's one terrible possibility and that Ukraine is totally destroyed. And I think if up to Putin, it will happen. You know, if the West stops helping Ukraine, I don't know if Ukraine has enough military hardware to keep those Russians away, not to defeat the Russians. So when we say, can Ukraine win? We don't mean, can Ukraine defeat Russia? That's not possible. There's too many of them. But can they push them back, that they go back and whatever propaganda they tell their own people say we won phase one we did what we meant to do whatever lies they're going to tell the russian public just lie they don't care tell whatever lie putin wants to tell his people tell them but just stop the war you can call it a success say whatever you want but just stop all this bloodshed and destruction so the terrible one conclusion one possibility is that ukraine is flattened the next possibility is that the war does stop at some point and the infrastructure is not damaged to the point where it's five years of, because then there's no economy anymore. So if they blow up, for example, all the major airports, if they blow up all the highways, they haven't done that. They've blown up the airport in, I think, in Kherson. Kherson is a, is, is a, 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 a small town. You know, it's not, it's not a big city. You know, watermelons come from Kherson. Roman from Drupal comes from Kherson. But apparently it's very beautiful. I haven't been there. It's not far from Odessa. I think it's about two, three hours away. Uh, um, but it's become a Russian. They, they have taken over the town. So it's like it's behind enemy lines, Kherson. Uh, but they haven't flattened it like Mariupol. And I don't think they will. That's not. From what I understand, and again, my knowledge is just watching the news. Uh, Mariupol was an example. They were saying, if you guys don't lay down your arms, you guys are next. And if, they, if their intention was to scare everyone, they've done a very good job because everyone is scared. They didn't blow up one building. They've blown up the whole town. 
sorry, the whole city. It's not a town. It's a big place. And I think Kharkov, they've blown up like half. And Kharkov is beautiful. So I, 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 I believe Mariupol is beautiful as well, but uh, it's by the sea. But Kharkov is known for its creativity and art and restaurants and art deco uh, movement. And just, just, so, so I think those were examples, uh, you know. So the second scenario is the war ends, but the damage is so extensive that you can't really live there, you know. The third scenario is that the war ends, there is damage, there's all this pain, but reconstruction and, and rebuilding starts. And those are the options, you know. Um, what are your What are your friends who are there? What are they telling you? Are they still resilient? Are they still hopeful that it won't be a waste? Ukraine waste? believes they will win, Ali. They they believe that, and I believe that they're going to win. Uh, we have to believe it. Um, on on and Roman actually, I keep quoting Roman. Roman, when we did his Zoom session, he says one line. He says the difference between Ukraine and Russia. Ukrainians know what they're fighting for. Sorry, Ukrainians, I said it wrong. Not Ukrainians. Ukrainians know what they're fighting for. If you stop a Russian soldier and say, what are you fighting for? They probably don't have a clue. What are they fighting? They were just told to go. They were told it's a special military exercise. You've heard some of these interviews on, on CNN and BBC and all the channels where they Russian soldiers that have spoken said, we were told we were just on an exercise. We didn't know we had to kill people. The Ukrainians know they have a purpose. The, the Russians have some vengeance. And what is that vengeance even based on? It's based on Putin's. I don't believe the average Russian wants to fight with the average Ukrainian. There was no fight eight years ago. Russians, like I, I said it earlier, Russians and Ukrainians were trading, getting married, going on holiday, having sporting events, uh, swapping movies, you know, music. It all stopped when they took over Crimea and started that separatist nonsense in Donbass. You know, I mean, what is separatist? It's basically... They went to a jail and let the prisoners go and say, here's guns, go and fight. They took unemployed homeless people and said, go and fight and create crap. They just created a conflict so that they could have like, like I, I'm convinced that Putin's entire aim is to create chaos in the world because it makes Russia look good. So they created chaos in Donbass. He's just creating chaos because when your country is going backwards and you say, but look at the chaos, we're actually okay. It kind of justifies your own bad economy. I mean, you, Russia... Russia was going backwards and Ukraine was growing at like 5% a year. I think they were just jealous, you know, and, you know, but, uh, you know. Do your friends feel the same way? Or do, they, do your friends in Ukraine, are they seeing it the same way? Uh, sorry, I've, I've said so many points. The same way as? No, the same way as that, that the reason why Russia caused the chaos was because Ukraine was growing at 5% and Russia was not. I, 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 I've, we've had many discussions. I think it's just one of many points. The, the main point is just some madness of, of Mr. Putin. We just, for some reason, Ukraine's very existence just irritates him. You know, but, but, but Eddie, the bigger discussion, it's more important. I actually now understand the question better. The bigger discussion is Russia, and this has been going on ever since the revolution in 2014, and this everybody like is on the same page entirely. Russia, Putin, 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 not Russia. Putin did not want a free press, a free democracy. Is that the word freedom? A democracy, a functioning democracy on his doorstep because it could inspire his own citizens to have a revolution. That's what they're scared of. So the fact that Ukraine was becoming more Western, was embracing Western values, Western economics, Western democracy, Western free media really freaked out Mr. Putin, really freaks him out. When they had this uprising now recently in Kazakhstan, the Russians sent in those peacekeeping forces because any neighboring ex-Soviet country, there were 16 countries in the Soviet Union, Russia and 15 others. So when one of the ex-Soviet countries starts to get too free thinking like Ukraine, I think it goes to upset the entire warped kind of historical perspective of someone like Vladimir Putin because like like the great Russian empire like look at this like like uh, the one story that's come up it's like it's like breaking up with your boyfriend and now you've got this angry ex-boyfriend and you start dating someone else 
and that ex-boyfriend gets abusive. Russia is the ex-boyfriend that can't let go. That can't handle the fact that the girlfriend has moved on and he's doing well. You know, it's it just driving them mad. That's the best analogy. I've heard that same metaphor. Is that the word metaphor? Analogy from quite a few people. Like it's an angry ex-boyfriend. And every time something good happens, they get angrier. And it's like, it's just pure evil. It's pure evil passion. Like what is it? It's not based. When they say Ukraine is a threat to Russia, what threat? But Alec, there's, there's so much to the story, as, as we all have been reading, the, the Budapest Memorandum, which I've been very familiar with for a long time, where, where Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal for its independence. And America and England were at the table when that agreement was constructed. And everybody's got amnesia. They gave up the third biggest nuclear arsenal to Russia for their sovereignty. And everybody seems to go, well, that was a long time ago. Nothing. It was an agreement. If you buy a house, you, the owner doesn't come back in 30 years and say, well, it's my house again. You have an agreement. It lasts forever. It's an agreement. So why does that agreement suddenly have less value? You know, I think the West owes Ukraine a bit here. You know, they all were a part of France, I think, as well, were a part of that process. If I'm not mistaken, there's a Wikipedia page on it. Uh, did you see that Russia is now trying to fine Wikipedia because they are calling it the war in Ukraine and not the military operation? I mean, it's just madness. I mean, how much Russia is trying to control its citizens, you know, control that narrative back in Russia. Uh, sorry about that noise, but that's the, that's the baby. Uh, um, but um, uh, um, yeah, so, so that big brother, uh, sorry, that, that ex-boyfriend uh, um, analogy is a, is a good one. Because I think it's emotional, I think it's irrational, I think it's cruel. You know, uh, I'm not a cruel person, but I have uh, uh, heard of the, the, the abused woman that's, you know, I, in the office sometimes back in the day when I was a waiter, a lady would come with black eyes and I'd say, what happened to you? Said, I don't want to talk about it. And someone said, don't, don't, don't be so stupid. Uh, boyfriend beat her up. Or the, I, I don't, Alec, I'm not like that. So I can't relate to someone beating up a kid, a woman, anybody. But you do get abusive people in the world. Apparently many. I mean, I think one in every four people are abused on this planet, according to statistics. So the, the, the aggressive ex-boyfriend story makes lots of sense. It's, like it, it, it's easy to understand that. And if, if they are the uh, uh, you know, uh, angry ex-boyfriend, then Ukraine is just going to be subject to cruel punishment all the time. And that, that, Eric, that's, that's a, great, a great way to maybe end off. Uh, I, have no, I have no concept of the time. Oh, uh, uh, and I've just looked at my watch. Uh, wow, an hour went by quickly. But some people have said that Ukraine is like the next Israel because suddenly your neighbors want to destroy you. So I think Ukraine has now fundamentally changed and it's lost its innocence. It was a very naive place, Alec. And that's why a lot of my friends, when they used to come visit me there over the years, said, geez, I love this place because it was naive, Alec. No taxi ever ripped you off. In restaurants, people were just so chatty and there was no, people weren't cynical, you know. Uh, I mean, obviously there are cynics and there are you know, people that aren't naive, but by and large, the country was quite innocent. It sounds like a strange thing to say, considering the stereotypes are so strong that Ukrainians are so corrupt and they'll steal from you. I never got robbed by anyone in Ukraine. Not uh, In fact, we've had stories where people left their wallets on restaurant tables and the waiter would run all the way down the road saying, with all the money, here's your wallet, sir. You left your wallet. You know, and you, what? What country are we in? People don't do that. You know, they would take the cash out. Or, but we had quite a few stories like that over the years where like, people just were amazed at the kindness and honesty. And I think sadly, Eric, this incident, maybe incident, there's this war, not incident, this war is removing the innocence of Ukraine. If, if, because there is a train of thought that this will happen again in five years. So that, to answer your question, what happens to us as a family, Eric, we are now looking at an alternative uh, place to live in Europe as a secondary home, depending on, you know, we, 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 we language, can we afford it, uh, you know, uh, weather, and the options, Alec, that are coming up, um, and you know this, because as, as a South African like me, immigration from this country with the brain drain is a very real phenomena and we ask where do people go and that interesting enough america since trump 
He's not in the top five anymore. I never hear of people going to America. It's lost its appeal. America is still America. It's powerful. It's innovative, but it's not the same America as, I know it's stating the obvious, but it's not the same. It's definitely lost its appeal. And I think the war in Ukraine is polarizing America and the world even further. Like Trump polarized, there was like two camps, you know, there's all, all this division in the world. And now there's this division about do we support Ukraine or don't we, you know? Uh, and I, I think that the story is going to have an effect on everybody. And we are now looking, you know, at to where else could we live. And the places that come up the most are Portugal and Netherlands. You know, if you take Australia out, because I don't want to live in Australia, you couldn't pay me to live in Australia. Just if I can run Australia down, I will. Not for any reason, but I just don't dig it. <laughs> just don't dig it. Sorry, Australians. I have lots of mates in Australia. I was there once for two weeks. It felt like two years. I find it to be so boring. You won't, I can't go back there. In America, I've lived in America. I don't have any problems with America, but it's just not on my top 10 at the moment. I, I feel that Americans are kind of, running in circles, you know, I don't know, it's America has just lost the plot, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I just, I think, I, I don't know, it's, you know, that's another whole discussion, but, um, but we would look at Europe and like uh, uh, England is just, London is very expensive and you know, I think uh, it's, I like to visit London and if I want to live there, but like Netherlands seems to be a very popular place for South Africans and also Portugal and Spain, Spain as well, uh, like France I think is, too snobby and too expensive. Germany is a bit too German, you know. I don't have any problems with Germans, but it's a bit, it's a bit just, you know, the, the German accent would drive me mad. Uh, I have an Austrian passport, and there are beautiful places in Austria, but it's a bit too Germanic for me. Same with Switzerland, you know. I mean, Switzerland is beautiful, but it's a place to retire. It's not, uh, I'm too hyperactive. Uh, you've been to Switzerland, Alec? Yeah, like, many Geneva's, times, yeah. Mm. beautiful but like you couldn't like what would you do there like it's so slow i mean it's like it's you know and it's so expensive and but then it's too small like you know zurich i mean an hour you've seen the whole city you know same with geneva very pretty you know, and, and safe and civilized but like it's not it's not it's not i believe lisbon is pumping you know but uh, yeah so we are thinking about what to do and a lot of my more affluent ukrainian friends uh, are all now we're all talking we've got like whatsapp groups like Whoever finds out some information, maybe we'll be 10 families all buy like an apartment in Lisbon and try and get a discount, you know, because everyone is thinking this war is going to, even if it ends tomorrow, it will come back. Putin, as long as Putin's alive, he's going to he's gonna be the angry ex-boyfriend. It's actually a good analogy because it's exactly what it is. He's the angry ex-boyfriend. And while his ex-girlfriend is getting now all this love from the West, because when the war is over, there's going to be so much goodwill pouring into Ukraine. Guilt money almost, you know. It's a funny thing to say, but I think there will be this guilt money because the people could have done more. And that's going to anger him even further. He's going to go, wow, you know, they kind of bounce back quickly. You know, again, that's assuming, Alec, on our three scenarios, the, the least destructive where the infrastructure isn't totally destroyed. You know, I don't, in Kiev, it's not destroyed. You know, in Lviv, it's not destroyed. In Odessa, it's not destroyed. I mean, Nikolaev, it's not good. Mariupol's gone. It's a city of half a million people. I just, it's just incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible, you know, that they just took. I mean, Kiev is like 1600, 1700 years old. It can be destroyed in a week. Wow. It's, uh, and people don't know, Alec, what comes from Ukraine or from Kiev. Like Fiddle on the Roof was written in Kiev and it's set in a village outside of Kiev. Ukraine is the origin of many, like, successful artists, athletes, engineers, uh, Steven Spielberg's family, David Copperfield's family, Steve Wozniak's family, the founder of Apple, you know, the co-founder, the founder of WhatsApp was Ukrainian. I mean, it, it doesn't stop, actually. One of the uh, PayPal founders, along with Elon Musk, was from Ukraine, you know. I mean, it just doesn't end. And I could keep you on the phone, on the call here for an hour on what comes from Ukraine. And people say, well, where's this place? No one knows where it is. If you ask people, where is it? Uh, it's somewhere in Europe, but where is it? Well, it's, it's on the Russian border. That's the problem. If Ukraine was in Spain's position or France, there wouldn't be this war. But their physical, it's like Israel. They are surrounded by countries that want to destroy them. Now Ukraine has got almost half the, the border mass is on 
their neighbor that wants to destroy them. And clearly has wanted to destroy them for a long time. He didn't just wake up and say, I want to destroy you. This anger has been festering and festering. Some people, I read some commentary that said Trump didn't attack during, sorry, Putin didn't attack during Trump's uh, 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 reign because he didn't want to embarrass Trump. And I thought it was an interesting insight. I don't know if it's correct, but I would buy that. I would buy that. And all this crap about, because I'm not a Trump fan, you know, and I know some people are, but I don't believe that Trump would have stopped this war with Russia. I think that Putin was, uh, Trump was running around Putin's, what's that expression? Like, I've got him under my finger, whatever the expression is, I mm. think now. But I think, I think Trump was running, uh, Putin was running circles around Trump. You know, I, th I think Putin was way smarter than Trump, you know, and way more evil as well, you know. Um, but I don't believe that Trump uh, would have stopped this war. And, um, and when I heard that comment, I heard it a few times, that uh, one of the reasons, yeah, is that Putin didn't want to embarrass Trump. Uh, that makes sense. But this war was a long time coming. This war was a long time coming. When they took over the Crimean Peninsula and when they started this separatist war in what's called Donbass in eastern Ukraine, um, the signs were there. I don't know why nobody, you know, I was in Ukraine. Nobody in, in Kiev took it thought it would land up in this position now, you know. But the war's been on for eight years. It just it just went up a notch, like a big notch. It like went up like mm. from from like you know ten percent to ninety nine percent, you know. But yeah, oh, but it's it's a terrible story. Look, it's a terrible story. And then Eric, if I can if I can leave one more thing, I'm I'm opening up a hornet's nest here. But I've got quite a few friends of all different cultures, you know, and. Uh, I've had black friends, Indian friends visit me in Kiev, and we're all pretty tight. They're not uh, uh, um, they're not colleagues; they're friends. They're real friends, and we have had some discussions. Like, what about Rwanda? What about Ethiopia? And my answer is: all these tragedies are terrible. They're all bad. But I wasn't living in Rwanda, so I know people will say, "But why are Europeans more important than Africans?" It's a good question. It is a good question. And I just want to put it out there. So if someone says, oh, yeah, why does anybody care about Ukraine? Why not Africa? You guys are from South Africa. I think we should care about everybody. It's not, uh, but I was living there. I wasn't living in Ethiopia. So I didn't have bombs dropping me in the night. And this wasn't a civil war. These were people making food, building IT systems. And their neighbor decided to bomb them. It's not the same as what happened in Rwanda. It's a very different story. So not to trivialize any of the genocides in Africa. They all are evil and bad. And everybody should have helped. But I was living there and it's very personal to me. You know, so it's not that I care any less for any other nation. I, I can't save the world. And I didn't trivialize apartheid. I didn't trivialize genocide in any country, not just in Africa. We've had genocide in Asia, all over the world. But I wasn't living there. I was living in a city that was getting on with the job. They weren't fighting with, they were peaceful. There was no war. They didn't want this. I don't think even Russian people wanted this. This is Putin. Putin has got some madness. And for some reason, he doesn't want Ukraine to exist. You know, that's another whole historical discussion. It could take hours. But that's this conclusion. He doesn't want Ukraine to exist. When people say, why? I don't know why. I don't know what the answer is. I'm sure. I mean, I have some, but I'm saying it's not a quick answer. It's hundreds of years of history. It's, they believe their own nonsense. You know, the Russians came from Kiev, but it used to be called Kiev and Rus. You know, they, the origin of Moscow came after Kiev. The, the Moscovites came from Kiev, but they became bigger and arrogant, and they decided they don't want Ukraine anymore. Putin and his, well, I don't even know if it's Putin and his circle. Maybe it's just Putin. Some people say that he did this on his own. Maybe two people, if you read some of the news reports, that very few people even knew what he was going to do. You know, I mean, again, we'll never know the truth. But it could be that Putin just a mad dictator on his own mission. I don't know. I don't know. But it doesn't really matter. What matters is that they've done this and Ukraine needs help. That's what matters. Because if Ukraine doesn't get the help and Putin destroys Ukraine, I think the world will change in a way that none of us will really want to like, laugh again. That means evil is going to spread. It's pure evil. There's no rational explanation. 
There's no bio labs in Ukraine. There's no Nazis. Well, there Nazis. There's like a handful of Nazis. Every country's got some Nazi movement in some garage somewhere. But just like we've got racists in every country, we should hopefully get rid of all these hating people. But it wasn't because of Nazis that Russia came to. That's just some excuse. What Nazis? It's just nonsense. You know, the latest rumor, bio labs, uh, uh, Ukraine, oh, so Ukraine was building nuclear weapons to attack Russia. It's just rubbish. What, you know? Yeah. Anyway, but Alec, thank you for your time. I, I hope that I did make some sense. Uh, Alec, I slept last night, first time in a while. So I'm actually compass mentors today. Oh. <laughs> well, it's been, it's always great, always great talking with you. But today's been very special, Ronnie. Thank you. And thank you just for just all your positive energy and, and, and support over many years of crazy projects. I've always been a fan of your work as well. And I, I, I hope that if anyone listens and is in a position to help, even if they donate $100, I mean, it, it's all going to fight evil. That, that's what I believe. You know? And we're all, we're all doing all we can. I, I just wish there was a magic wand that you could wave and like this bad dream will end. But it's not a, it's happening. It's, it's happening. As we speak, people are dying.